Hey, dude, you look kind of you look kind of pixelated. So you look like um you're from like Minecraft or something. Oh, for no, 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 it's not that bad. It's not that Probably bad. Probably shit in that. <laughs> um, yeah, guys. Uh, so if you're if you're watching, this is this is Ben Ben Wharton, Benji Wharton. Uh, is is it Ben Wharton now that you're? I know I always called you Ben, but do you I've call tell everyone to call you? To be honest. <laughs> Why does everyone um, call you Benji? My everyone that knows me calls me Ben. Um, I'm only Benji on Instagram and to people that like don't know me but at the same time okay. I like being called Benji as well so like I don't really have any preference and normally it's like I, like, I think of like Benji as like my powerlifting like or alter ego as like stupid as that sounds but it's literally like yeah, people yeah. Like, whenever I'm at a comp like people will be yelling for me and like saying Benji and I'm, in the back of my mind I'm like oh that guy just knows about Instagram it just like do you know what I mean like I like right, it, it I, helps I, don't, you. I don't have a preference at all it, help, it helps you to know who know who, how well someone knows you if they call you Benji. <laughs> yeah, literally, <laughs> literally. You can dichotomize your your friends. <laughs> um, so I am really excited to talk with you because obviously we worked worked together for a while uh, under uh, under RTS um, mm-hmm. with kind of a bottom up framework for training, which is kind of evolving. You know, it should evolve like any good system it should kind of change over time um but let's back up from like for people who don't know you like what's your what's your journey been like the last what's the what three years or so for, for four years how, you know, it's a long how, time how frame do you want to go do you know what i mean like do we start do, do i start at the beginning and give my whole <laughs> <laughs> so i guess i'll intro the beginning i'll tell this my side of the story from how like okay. and then you can catch me up to what's happened okay so ben started uh ben reached out to me in 2018 in november i think t- november 2018 right and then and prior to that he was working with luke who i was coaching at the time so luke was coaching ben then I, and I was coaching Luke and then Ben started coaching with me and we had a really interesting beginning to our coaching journey because interesting. <laughs> yeah. And by interesting, oh, I mean, it was a bit of a shit show. <laughs> it was a shambles, man. <laughs> Some of the worst <laughs> training I have ever done in my life. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, I, I tell people this all the time because with, with when you're working with like a, a lifter that actually is just going to put everything into it, it really, really sucks when like you realize that it's not them, it's you. You know what I mean? Like it's it's the or not maybe you, but it's like the program or it's the style of training. It's you one know? of those things where like like it's just the classic RTS approach of like cool, like you know we want to get stronger, let's just do loads of singles. And my body was like, <laughs> sorry, what? <laughs> I don't want to throw RTS under the bus, but it is definitely one of the things that people perceive RTS as. But to 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 my own not defense, but to put it on me more so, that's something that I just I guess I I was too bought into the sauce, you know? Like it was too like, hey, let's when you do singles, you got you know, you gotta practice singles because that's what we do as powerlifters. So let's do that. And that was that was still relatively recent into me utilizing like quote unquote emerging strategies or like bottom up training. And so it was you were one of the first lifters who I brought into like a an international competition within that framework. And yeah, you just like weren't responding to uh, not to anything. You did have a good like to first anything. block. <laughs> cuz cuz you just had a good block leading in. <laughs> You're like, you're like, I want, I want to get strong. I'm like, tight, we're going to do these like singles and you're going to crack out on intensity and uh, it's going to go great. And then it didn't, but it did go decently leading into the, it was like, the testing session. It was like every time I did a single, I linearly got weaker. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. It was like, like inverse periodization. It was worse than the last single and there was nothing that I could do about it at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. And that put me on my toes a little bit, like, I guess on my heels, I don't know the right word, but it made me realize that there's something going on here and whatever it is, it's not, it's not like I can just convince you that there's something to change. Like you're doing all of the work and it was very obvious that it wasn't, that the, that the system needed to change. And there was this hypothesis I had, I remember that 
hey, maybe the reason why the you know E1 or M is, is like kind of going down is because we are transferring from higher rep ranges two singles are two like higher intensities and maybe the estimated one max is just getting more accurate and like that you know the true the true your true capability is more in alignment with what the single is presenting but that wasn't you know that wasn't really true like you you've done you had done more you know in our first few months than you did leading in, at worlds um though you technically hit a pr or something it was like not anywhere close to what you were doing in training so yeah, at Worlds, um, right? I think I think um, I think you were partially correct in that. Obviously, the way that RTS and a lot of things go about it is they go about it with in terms of like an estimated one at max. And I guess I mm -hmm. am just quite good at rep work to where like you know if I do a set of five or a set of six or a set of seven or a set of eight or like in that kind of mid to like high rep ranges, even like threes mm -hmm. and fours, I feel like um, like like the rep work that I can do just tends to make it look like my one max is my estimated one max gives a much higher estimate uh, estimated one max so then as soon as like yeah. the rep wing just get lower and the rps progress naturally with kind of like i don't know for me if i was to you know sort of go up five kilos i'd lose about one one rep or one rp or something like that pretty much like quite right. linearly um mm -hmm. and like obviously when it comes to like percentages and like how it's supposed to work i guess it's just not really how it's supposed to work and you're supposed to uh, when you're a stronger lifter like you know you should be able to rep a lot further away than like to your one max i guess i don't know it's it's confusing but i think that, that that is correct so obviously then that makes it look um like i'm you know not like not only am i like, not responding but it looks makes it look really bad when actually like it was just a kind of a case of like it just wasn't really a, a, like a, a clear response there where you know uh, doing these singles and kind of they were either they weren't moving or they were kind of going backwards or i was progressing them in small ways but the rps were jumping up like quite drastically um so yeah yeah it, 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 uh, and obviously you know seeing how sad and, and disheartened you were at, at worlds was like okay yeah something um, needs <laughs> you know something needs to change yeah w with that world like honestly like i've thought about that a lot and like standout worlds i think about all that i've done 14 comps now and of the 14 comps that was the single worst not not worst comp like obviously like i've had worse performances in terms of like where i thought i was going to be versus where i was um but it was like you know to have uh, my whole goal when i was a junior my whole everything i set out to do was i one day i wanted to make it internationally i wanted to like go to worlds and i wanted to like compete there and like, that was that was the dream you know so to do all that and then eventually get there and have it all come to fruition and then perform shit was just like it was like br like it broke me a little bit do you know what i mean you had to like yeah. i'd like rebuild on that and like re get myself back into that but yeah 100 percent. yeah and I think that's, I mean, I think that's like the downside of, of kind of building things like from the, from the ground up, because if you start out in a good place, then it's great. But if you start out in kind of a rocky place it's, and there's, you know, competition coming up, it's like, do we follow the, the trail of, uh, you know, what periodization would imply, you know, like do we just keep getting the intensity higher as we go to the meet? Cause that's what like all of the, you know, that's what everyone are talking thinks about. you should do, you know, that's what literally right. every powerful program ever it's like literally like we get close to the meet we lift yeah. heavier and that's how we do it and you know and yeah. to an extent i think that is correct you know by the end of the day like you do have to get some exposure and some practice with heavier loads which is kind of the line right. that i've tried to, to to tread from here on out but anyway yeah to talk more about kind of like you know obviously you know um worlds didn't go to plan we turned around and then you know juniors went better but still not exactly well and it's mainly just because we didn't really prep for that at all it wasn't really the focus because we knew that euros was straight after that so we kind of like put all our eggs in the basket of focusing on euros and then as a result i mean you, i mean to be fair like Br the, the british juniors didn't go badly at all like i did i performed okay I performed better than worlds definitely um but euros was where, was where we really turned up and did really well and that was with a completely unconventional approach obviously like i mean with that we were just like you know what fuck it like we've been we've tried to do singles about 15 different well like we literally tried everything we tried yeah. every possible approach to put a single in a program that we could do and we were like it just doesn't work <laughs> so it was like all right yeah. like let's just do rep work and then see if you can do a one at max at the end of it and yeah. it was like it yeah. actually worked <laughs> and it was like nice. yeah. all right <laughs> yeah and that i think as a coach was like my most revelational moment where it was like man everything uh, is wrong 
like everything that we thought to be like a truth might work for people, but like we can do shit like that. And it just blows people out of the water. I mean, you didn't even do a competition squat for like 10 days leading into the into yeah, the Euros. So we did the flip we, week, we didn't did, we? It, was, it we wasn't the quite 10 week. days, but it was something like that. Yeah, it was quite a it was while, like, wasn't it? Yeah, I was like, it was a... Yeah, and we didn't yeah, even do open. Right, we did like be ten days because we did a flip week. Yeah. So obviously, we did like last heavy comp exposure on like the I don't know the Monday, and then it was like mm-hmm. like I did a, a secondary squat day, which was high bar, and I did high bar again the, the following week because it was a flip week, and then we did the comp squat obviously on the platform. So yeah, it was something like ten days. Yeah, so, I mean the, the comp squat. I mean, like obviously I've refined that approach a lot since since then. Like the comp squat on mm-hmm. that day, like it didn't feel as technically well grooved. As, well, obviously, yeah. that's what you'd expect, isn't it? You've not done a comp squat in 10 days. But it did yeah. work. And, and the I, point is, I was strong in the gym, and then I was like equally as strong like on the platform. Like it did actually. And I think that's a lot of that was down to like um, in a conventional approach, obviously, the intensity goes up and the volume goes down. And I think with the conventional approach, like you just pull back on the volume too much, and it just means that I detrain. Like I was just like coming into the comp and I wasn't feeling like anything was well grooved. And as well, I've come to the realization about myself as well since then is that um, when it comes to like intensity, I maybe only get like, in my mind, I'm pretty sure I get about two, two really heavy exposures. Um, and it's like, mm-hmm. it doesn't even matter how much rest I have. Like if I've used those two exposures, that's it. So if you hit those two exposures in inside the block rather than on the platform, I get the platform, I'm just weak. And there's nothing that I can do about that because I've I've, I've done it. I, that's it. Like, that's my that's my bet that's my best it's done it's, it's, i did it in the gym rather than the platform so when it comes to that like it's it's about getting those at the right time which means i only really get one heavy lift in the gym before i literally do it on the platform so since then what i've done is well me and eric Marta came up with it which was literally i would do um like three weeks of just sort of like rep work like sort of like uh triples doubles whatever we want to do kind of there but like you know mm-hmm. not quite singles not quite as intense as hardcore as that and i had to make sure that i only right. shot those or was on rpe with those spot on so that i you know that i was staying in the pocket and they weren't a properly heavy exposure and then i'd do one mm-hmm. week of singles on on the week four um and then flip week and then on the week five that's my second heavy exposure with enough rest between those two points because it's also like doing back-to-back heavy exposures i also can't really tolerate so i need i needed enough recovery time to be able to put that second one together but that's the approach and it's worked since then it's worked really well to be honest with you wait are you using flipped week still yeah slip, uh, yeah did I, you I, use it into like right seniors and i was like Mark, yeah. i want to do this because he literally was like cool here's your taper and it was like openers and like last one openers and last one ups and i was literally like yeah i'm, I'm not doing that i was like i'm sorry i'm not because <laughs> yeah. like i've done like, this before <laughs> so here i was actually like i should split my comps up into did openers and last one ups and the comps went badly did a did something uh-huh. different or a flip week and it went well and it's because of the volume the yeah. volume difference because like i'm doing like three working reps or something versus i'm doing like you know whatever Seven, whatever eight. three by five yeah. or something you know yeah yeah that's so he's he's he got he was comfortable with that you know was he nervous when he told him he was like i've never seen this before <laughs> and i was like oh, you know, jimmy came up with it and i'm I've, I've <laughs> great like so, sorry, man, oh dude <laughs> that that's my favorite no because that's the thing it's like i can't i've tried using that with other lifters and usually they aren't comfortable as much with it because they feel like the the comp squat i think squat uh, I mean, so I use it for a mock meet recently with a lifter and they, they felt like, uh, you know, their warm ups felt good, but there's something that they were missing on like the heavier intensities. And so we're going to try, cause we just started together. We're going to try doing a normal, not a normal taper, but like leading into the comp, just regular on like the fifth exposure, whatever it is and see how that feels. Cause, um, yeah, it, it, it's one of those things where I think you do a good job of it, but I think it's because of how connected you are to your lifting. Like you don't, you don't go. I don't think you go into any of your lifts just thinking like, yeah, this is just a pause squat or something. You know, I think you are able to kind of visualize it in a very similar like intensity and arousal level for for these other you know secondary uh, tertiary lifts. Whereas I think it might be too much of a psychological downturn for some lifters. If you're doing, you haven't done a comp squat in yeah ten days or whatever, um, and I think that can can impact lifters for sure. And that 
kind of leads me to the other question about like how do you currently stru- how what's changed since like what has changed since working with me after the after euros in terms oh, of you, whether your training stuff, structure <laughs> yeah what, what's going on everything Update is me. different no no not everything um <laughs> yeah. to go on to the previous topic quickly though um obviously yeah. you know like we say about not doing a comp squat in 10 days the thing that is different there with me and how i'm using a flip week now is i have obviously one heavier exposure that is you know that's that's the heavy exposure on like the day one for example of my week um and my second squat day is still a secondary squat day and it's a lower priority day, but it's still comp squat. It's just comp squat rep work. So it means that when we do a flip week and obviously then that comp squat is on is, is the last thing that I do before I compete, um, it's still mm-hmm. comp squat. So it's still specific enough where I get some practice doing that movement exactly, which I think is quite important mm-hmm. in terms of actually being able to groove something well on the day. Um so that's the difference there, and that's that's what's been really good. Um, but then to talk about kind of what I've done differently since Euros, I mean, I think it all started, like I say, at that Worlds. Like, obviously, um, you know, competing at Worlds, it didn't go the way I wanted to at all. Um, and it was, like, in a way, like, it breaks you, but then it's a big learning experience of, like, okay, like, I need to start doing things differently. Because at that point, I don't think I was properly... Obviously, I take my property really seriously, and I always have. But I think it was the game changer to be like, you know, like I can, I can do better. There's just things that you find that you can do better. Things like nutrition, things like sleep that I can, that I can be more on and, and take more seriously. Um, things like like active recovery, like always, always getting enough steps in, like that in itself is, has been a big thing that I've been really on, and it's, it's really helped me. Um, but, That's interesting um, with the step count. Mm. Yeah, because the, uh, the step count stuff is like stuff you talk about, but it's like, I mean, I anecdotally notice a benefit from it in terms of recovery. It just seems like it keeps my hips loose and pain seemed not to happen as much, you know. For me, for me, like I, I seem to like squat and it, I squat and deadlift a lot with my adductors, which sounds weird. Like people are like, you get DOMS from conventional deadlift in your adductors. It's like, yeah, my back doesn't get fatigued like at all. It's mm-hmm. weird. That's so, lucky. Yeah, I don't know. I guess my back's just made of like steel or something, but like literally it just feels fine all of the time. Like if I if I get fatigue in my back, I need to deload like immediately. Because at that point I've done some serious irreparable damage in that block and I'm not gonna be able to recover from that within the next like ten days or something. Um so yeah, um, my adductors get a lot of fatigue and I think walking um, and getting enough steps in like that makes a big difference for those. Like, I just I, I just think I must walk in a way that's quite adductor dominant, which sounds weird to say, but like obviously they are hip extensors. So I, like, I, do, I do feel like they, they play a role there and that, that getting that movement through them in a way helps in some way. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yeah. That, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, been... I, I feel like the same. I do sumo. I mean, I pull sumo, so it's a bit different, but... Oh, I feel the exact same. Like my one of them, are, man. It's like one my, of them. <laughs> I would, dude. I wish I could pull hook. I, I wish I could pull like hook grip conventional. I just, I'm trying hook grip, man. It's it's. Are you awful. trying it right now? Oh, it's awful. <laughs> um, What's your process been like for that? Oh, I, I'm just manned up and done it. Like <laughs> my full process is like, yeah, like right. my full process was this. It was literally like cool um you know i keep dropping deadlifts and have for the last two or three years um if i don't mm-hmm. drop a deadlift my, my strength is limited by that by that grip like you know obviously euros like i only just held on to that third deadlift by the skin of my teeth and since then i've had yeah. a few comps where, where either i've dropped it or it's been like right on the line and obviously this british i won um but i won with a deadlift where i mean i like for me personally like i can grind like mad like um the, i pulled three four five as my third and genuinely felt like i probably had the strength for like at least three three five two maybe three five five so i had the strength for like maybe even another 10 kilos um just because i know like when it's a third how much i can give to that third deadlift and how much like you know you just you just know how much you got in the tank don't you so i knew yeah. i had a lot more left but the grip was literally on the limit like i had not i maybe had i i don't know if i could have held two and a half kilos more and it and like if i dropped that for example i'd have lost i'd literally have lost in my opinion hey do you want to get stronger pack on muscle and develop a unique training system that evolves with you as you progress in your training journey i'm jim ellie the founder of zao strength and i've been coaching powerlifters around the world for the last eight years of my life and it's been an incredible experience we are happy to release self-determined coaching you'll gain access to all of this first a mobile training app with over 35 tried and 
tested training program by Toes. In-depth technique tutorials for every exercise. You'll also gain access to our members only Discord server with five professional coaches to help you overcome your training. Within our inclusive Discord server, we also offer weekly live coaching calls to teach you cutting edge training concepts. Additionally, you'll be able to join weekly live form checks to get immediate and direct feedback about your technique from one of our coaches to make sure you can take your training to the next level. Click the link below to sign up now, blast through your plateaus, get stronger, and develop a training style that works for you. Um, to, to finish talking about, about hook grip, um, so yep. obviously like I've been limited by that for a while uh, and obviously like at British, it's just another another, uh, another wake up call that I should just man up and do that despite the pain. So literally like the other session, I ripped the shit out of my thumb as well. I'm, I'm just so oh, I literally shit. Was like, cool, I'm just going to do this. So I got up to like 270 and I did a single at 290 with it and it felt horrendous. It felt like my, my thumbs were literally going to dislocate um, and obviously like a little tear there, which is annoying. Um, but I'm just... I'm just going to muscle it. I'm just going to keep going with it. And like, I've got like 12 or 13 weeks to make it manageable. Um, and hopefully it is by then. We'll see. So when did you start trying hook grip? Like a, a, a month ago? Literally yesterday. <laughs> no, literally, Wait, literally really? <laughs> literally first attempt to pull two night with it. So yeah. Oh, oh, but you didn't do it at the meet. No, 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 no. It's only oh, since okay. the meet that I've been like, all right, cool. I literally have to do this. So how did it feel moving into a heavier weight class? Because you did that as well. That's changed moving into the 120s. Yeah, um, I've been, I've been, I mean, I was kind of obviously coronavirus. I got up to sort of like 108, 109, maybe even 110 during that period. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I could go back down to 105s and that'd be fine. But, you know, I think as a junior, I'd always kind of planned once I was in the open to potentially move into the 120s and slowly fill that out and just keep growing and getting stronger. Because ultimately, like, that's what I really care about is just improving myself. Um, so that was kind of always the plan. And I like, obviously, as a 93, when I used to compete as a 93 way back then, I stayed as a 93 for way longer than I should have done. I was not the right height for a 93. And I just, I mm -hmm. knew that that had held me back in some way in terms of my competitiveness. And it, in the long run, it, had, it cost me a few months of training that I could have been more productive with if I'd been in a surplus the whole time and, and not spend that time, you know, holding myself back almost. So I was like, I will never do that again. So once I got up to like 110, I was like, you know what? Like, I don't cut well into competition. In my opinion, you shouldn't cut into a competition unless you are like seriously, seriously elite. Um, and, you know, I, I just think, you know, th this idea of kind of like, oh, you, you're going to be at your absolute best and you're going to, you know, beat these lifts that you've done in the gym. But you're also going to do it when you have these variables that you've created for yourself, like, oh, you know, you've not eaten properly or eating normally or, you know, you, you, you're dehydrated and, you know, you've fucked with your water intake and whatever. It's like you don't need that shit. And it's probably going to affect you. And if you want to actually have a good day, and bear in mind, you know, you only compete once every six months, maybe once every four months at the, at the, at the earliest, you know, you're not competing often. Mm -hmm. So that one day needs to yeah. go well. Um, and, you know, if there's like a 50% a chance that the water cut just ruins you and you just don't perform because you cut too much weight, you know, if that's a, that's a yeah. risk that you just don't need, it's a variable you don't need. So I was like, I'm never doing that again. So I, since then, I never have. <laughs> yeah and it's like uh especially where you're i mean you're you're tall you know you're relatively tall like you have a lot of weight that you can gain it's yeah. not like i mean what what are you weighing in now like you didn't weigh at 120 did you so i'm so i'm six foot um which is about the right height to be a 120 if i was to like spend mm -hmm. 10 years filling out which i plan to um but yeah, um, I, like I, I was one ten. I've been like around one ten to one eleven for a while. I, I got up to like one twelve six months ago before last British. I, I was one twelve, one thirteen, that kind of period. And then I, I was about one eleven and one eleven and a half, something like that. About two weeks out from this comp, and then made the mistake of being like, "Oh, I'm too light. I need to eat as much as I possibly can and gain as much weight as I can for this comp day because it might help me in some way." Yeah. And then it yeah. kind of messed with my leverages a little bit, and I felt a little bit weird on the day, and like my you had a bit more gut mass. <laughs> than I was used to my belt didn't fit normally and shit like that so I'm coming back down a little bit but yeah my, I weighed in at 113.9 so I managed to gain like two kilos <laughs> um but it was literally that's a there's a fake kilo there anyway because I literally drank a liter of milk before weighing as well which a liter weighs a kilo so I was probably like 113 something like that pro tip before competition drink a liter of milk 
Yeah, absolutely, man. I was eating as much and drinking as much as I could. <laughs> but yeah, um, I often have like a pre-training meal of like cereal and, and whatever before, I, before, oh, I, before okay. I train. So like it was just specific to what I had been doing in the prep. Got it. You weren't just like, holy crap, we got to go mad. Go mad. We <laughs> yeah, got a go gallon of milk. <laughs> <laughs> so so with the heavier, like with the more weight that you have, are you noticing like that your training response is improving? Like, are you noticing a difference in training? Not drastically, though. <laughs> no. No. I mean, obviously, like, as you gain weight, you pretty much just get stronger. It's just how it works. It's just like not trying <laughs> myself and allowing myself to slowly just keep growing. And, and in the long term, like, a lot of the guys that are 120s are, are pretty much fat. Like that's pretty much the truth. Um, and anyone who, who says anyone who says they're not fat, you lie to yourself. Um, yeah. So my, my goal is to fill out the one twenties at least reasonably well. And if I can do that, I think I'll be really competitive because I am short in that weight class at six foot. Like I'm pretty short. So as a result, I have the most muscle mass. If I have the most, most muscle mass, I lift the most weight. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just logic, yeah. isn't it? Really. So that I'm putting myself in, in in a in a weight class that in the long term I can thrive in rather than being a 105 and being strong but at the same time at this point in the opens now my goals are all i want to achieve like lifetime level goals i want to you know i want to bench over like 220 and shit like that one day like that's that's or even 500 pounds and they have 227 on there or something like that and it's like i want to squat 350 i want to deadlift like you know 375 or some shit like some really big weights and i don't see myself doing those as a 105 so why would i stay as a 105 do you know what i mean yeah 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 <laughs> It's good like, to be in that headspace. I just want to be really strong, mate. And I just don't feel like yeah. I'm really strong right now. So the best thing you can do that now is go for weight class and just like get massive. Do you know what I mean? How how long did it take you to kind of recover from like the COVID like down, you know, depression period? Uh, you know, like, yeah, did you ever feel I mean, like depressed from it? Oh, for sure. It was tough. Honestly, like obviously I'm so, I'm quite extroverted as a person, but as well, um, you know, training in a gym, like I, I'm quite a hype lifter and I tend to get a benefit from being around other people, especially like-minded people. I, you know, at the gym I was training at before COVID, I was surrounded by um, like a team, like a, a powerful team of all of my mates, all of which we were all pushing each other. It was a nice competitive environment and it brought the best in everybody. Um, and, and just the natural hype that was that was in that group and that was there was was it was really helping me lift really well. I was having a great period before coronavirus happened. And obviously it happens and I'm training in a home gym um, and it just isn't the same. It's just way harder. It was way harder for me to like have good sessions and it was way easier with those kind of like, you know, worse quality sessions where like I was having to force it a bit more to try and lift the same kind of weights. Um, it was really easy to like mentally spiral a little bit or to like let those bad sessions just get in your head and, and, and mess you up. And, you know, it, if you're training, like, especially when you're trying to properly push yourself, like you'll, you'll be sat there in the gym and you're literally like, like I'm alone right now. Like there's no one here. No one is watching what I'm doing. No one is making me do this. And this is rough. And I don't want to do this some days. And that's how you feel. Whereas a lot of the time the environment and a, a true gym environment as well, it's very hard to replicate. Like it's like you, you don't appreciate it until you don't have it. If you've ever properly trained on your own, you know, in, in, especially during winter when it's dark as well, like it's it's just hard to it's harder to motivate yourself, but it's harder to be productive. So yeah, that's that's pretty much what I <clears throat> I've been feeling. I I like quit the my gym because I their COVID policies were really annoying. They wouldn't enforce masks anywhere and. I didn't want to get sick, so I was like, "Fuck it, I'm I'm canceling the 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 gym membership and um, training at home." I mean, I train here in my little dungeon. Um, dungeon, it, I it love sucked. It. <laughs> it sucked for a while, you know. Like it, it did same things that you're describing. Like just getting motivated. Like you just kind of skip sessions. Cause I mean, you probably didn't skip sessions. Did you skip any sessions? No, not even one. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Mate, it was awful I, though. It is. <laughs> yeah. I wish I'd skip sessions. There were sessions that I like fully you'd... quit out on. I, like I do this thing where yeah. like occasionally, like I mean, I don't. I only do it when it's like literally I'm stuck at home. Like I only did it during lockdown. But it's like I would literally quit out on a session and be like, no, I can't do this. Like this feels terrible. Or like you know, I'm having a rough session. I'm just done. I'm just done. I'm leaving the gym. I'd leave the gym. And then about an hour would pass, and I'd be like, I feel really fucking guilty that I gave up on that. So I'd be like, all right, let's go back in and let's, let's do it better. <laughs> so I just go in and just punish myself more. I don't know, man. <laughs> you definitely have more of a, uh, a 
guilt focused training sometimes like you definitely get down on yourself for like not trying hard enough and stuff like that yeah whereas like i just always want to I mean, you always want to give your best you know and like i something i'm way better with now but that used to be something i was really bad for in the past for sure was kind of you know yeah. I, I think I'm. I get way too obsessed with trying to make sure that everything that I do is like optimal or it's as good as it can be. Um, and it's very hard chasing perfection or chasing, you know, tra- and chasing your absolute best effort is like a really difficult thing to do consistently. And obviously, when there's loads of factors at play and things that are out of your control, like training at home, like you kind of have to give yourself the benefit of the doubt and give yourself a pass sometimes. And that's something that I didn't do that I should have done in lockdowns for sure. Um, and I do regret that. Yeah, I mean, I think from the coach's perspective, I think you you definitely give as much as like a human can into powerlifting. Maybe maybe there's a few people who give more, you know, in terms of like time. But I mean, for your abilities, I think you pretty much have given everything into it that like you can. And I think the thing that sucks is when like you do that, and you know, your maybe your mental health isn't isn't great, or you're, you're missing something and you know, you're missing something like a gym environment or people to be around. And like, you still, you're putting the energy in, but you're not getting as much out, whether it's like the actual training response or, and, and, or like having people to share that with, you know, and being in, in that community. Cause there's like that sense of belonging that you kind of lose as you start doing it more and more like on your own. And I, I know there are some people that like enjoy training alone, but even I, I don't know, even the people that enjoy training alone seem to perform better like at a at a gym. Um, like even even like Mike T, like he trains at home, but then he'll go and train with like Bryce Lewis and he has like a great session typically. You well, know, yeah, like there's that. If you like mate, if I was to train with Bryce Lewis, I'd be strong as fuck that day. Like I'd have the yeah. best session I've ever had. Because I'm yeah. with Bryce Lewis. I got to show off. I got to do it. I got to turn up and do my absolute best. It's like uh-huh. that. Those eyes on you. That pressure. Like it's. It's literally like. Um, it's literally just like natural social pressure. Is it just brings out the best in you because you don't want people to say to see you fi- like fail, especially people that you don't yeah. see often or you, you know that you don't have interactions with often. I'll have really good sessions when I go to gyms that I wouldn't normally go to, and I meet people that I wouldn't normally meet. Um, like right. it just always tends to bring out the best in me because like there's that natural pressure there. It just autom- it's just automatic. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, and I think there are obviously people where that's like they get you know performance anxiety and they get nervous and they like just want to go home. But I'm similar in that way. Like I, that's why I stream on Twitch because it's like uh, <laughs> someone in the chat asks, I don't know much about powerlifting. Is there typically much pharmacology involved? Um. So he's no, drugs. I mean. <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> basically he's asking for on drugs it depends on who yeah. it is, man. It depends on who it yeah. is yeah it depends if your supplements are tainted and you get like actually recently i saw that there's a, a study on like tainted supplements and they're saying like 15 percent of of supplements might be tainted um uh someone sent it to me yesterday uh yeah a substance is prohibited by WADA were found in most of the supplements analyzed in this review. Some of them were pro hormones and or stimulants with a co- uh, contamination rate between 12 and 58%. Non-intention intentional doping is a point to take into account before establishing a supplementation program. So I don't I don't know what supplements they took a look at this study, but check your fucking supplements yeah, otherwise okay. most my understanding, and I don't know how common it is in, in the British powerlifting, but like my understanding is there are probably going to be a few people, you know, every year they get caught with with anabolics. And, and I, I don't mean like they get caught and then like there are other people who just don't get caught. I think if you're worth, if your performance is good enough and you're on drugs, you're going to get caught because you're going to get tested. And like the testing protocols that we have now are pretty damn good. I don't know how common it is in, in, in the UK. If, if, was there is there a recent test that happened? I feel like something someone got caught recently. All right, I gotta be really careful how I talk about this. Um, so, <laughs> um, basically, the like my approach towards drug testing, um, I like to believe that everybody that I'm against is natural, um, especially in British powerlifting, where I feel like we have a really good way of going about things, where it's very much like quite a, quite a close knit community, and if you're on stuff 
like and you get caught you just get completely ostracized and it's a real like name and shame type thing and i really like that and i think that definitely helps um and <laughs> yeah. i also you don't want to be shamed <laughs> yeah i don't want to be shamed like yeah. like i like you get that's the, that's the thing people don't get if you get caught in the in a natural federation you're done like yeah everyone stops talking to you you don't have a social life anymore and you got to go i mean what usually what happens they're like yeah well screw it i'm gonna go untested anyway but still like it's a, it's a big social cost yeah yeah it's it, because you're an asshole because you literally cheated do you know what i mean like there was no need for you to cheat but you did it anyway like do you know because there, mm -hmm. there are these other federations you could just go into and that's fine like no one's no one's bothered about the fact that you did take steroids or whatever they're bothered about the fact that you did that and then tried to claim you were natural by competing against guys that aren't and beat them because you're cheating like it's literally mm -hmm. not fair um so yeah like a hundred percent um Mm -hmm. When it comes to drug testing, obviously, British powerlifting doesn't do a ton. Uh, obviously, you always wish they did more, but, you know, obviously, testing is very expensive and it's 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 not ideal. So, you know, um, there's very limited testing in British powerlifting. Um, and in the IPF as a whole, I don't think, like, it's anywhere near kind of where it should be or where it would need to be. Um, USA is way better. And, like, that's why, you know, that's why they were kicked out because, you know, they wanted, like, basically – the whole thing with the IPF and the USAPL where, you know, obviously um, the IPF wanted wider testing specifically um, and the USA wanted to test at all levels and test regularly and test as many people as possible. And those two things just don't line up. They just don't work together. So um, the, the IPF kicked them out as a result of that. But I, I mean, I would much rather compete in the USA, you know, level of testing where, you know, everyone's getting tested because you, you catch those people that way. You know, it's, 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 it's the cleanest possible sport that you could have. Um, so I'm mm -hmm. 100 like behind that. That's what, that's what I want. Um, but yeah, um, for British powerlifting, like, you know, the, the, the people do get tested. People do get out of comp tested. Um, I've been tested, I think, three or four times, which is really good. I'm really happy with that. Um, and, you know, it's if I'm getting tested regularly and I, and I don't view myself as that that crazily good of a lifter, then I feel like, you know, a lot of the top guys will be getting tested, which is a good thing. Um, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, you never know. You never know if someone's on or not. Uh, you know, I, I, like even guys that I've competed against, the guys in the weight classes I've looked at them in the past and been like, I don't know about you, but I choose mm -hmm. to believe that you're natural because – that's you know that like because because the amount of people that have said to me oh you're on steroids when they don't know me um they've never met before uh they just see that like my skin isn't great and i'm really strong or explosive and i'm big and therefore it's like you must mm -hmm. be on gear because i don't think what you've done is possible and it's like well i am yeah. I'm natural so <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what i mean like but you know, and it so sucks because you, I mean, someone else and try and take away someone else's like achievements or someone else's or what someone else has done, um, and just blanket, just you're on gear. I don't care. Do you know what I mean? I, do, I don't like <laughs> yeah. that. But I always choose to yeah. believe natural until proven otherwise, basically. Yeah, it's healthier that way too because you, I mean, you're probably going to look like an asshole if you just start throwing, you know, accusations at people. Like, I think this guy's on drugs. And then yeah. it's like, okay. Yeah, like you said, people say that to you. I remember when I started lifting, um, I was just convinced like everyone was on drugs. Like I, I was the asshole. Um, a lot of people on drugs also say that to justify their own use of drugs. Yeah, and for so sure. like in the uh, untested federations, they think everyone in the tested federations are just like really good at getting away with it. And it's like I don't know if you understand how difficult it is to get away with it. Maybe for a few years, you know, you're under the radar and no one knows you, but. Yeah, eventually you get into a competition with a bunch of people who've been there for a while. You show up for your first time and, and bust ass. It's like you're going to get tested. And if you're if you're on on gear, that means anything. I mean, you can probably get away with something that's like probably not very impactful on, you know, on your strength. Um, I don't know what that would be, but most of the drugs that mean anything, if you get tested, you're going to have metabolites of those drugs. And if not immediately in the long run, like I think with water testing, they can choose to do a blood test as well, which then can can be stored and it can be analyzed for, you know, metabolites in the long run, which in that case, you really aren't going to get away with, with anything because the testing yeah. takes a bit more time and you're going to test everything, every part of the, the blood. I don't know how common that is, but uh, 
I mean, people have been banned, you know, from the IPF. Like, it's not like it doesn't happen. But I thought, you know, I thought Mike Tushira was on drugs. I was convinced that Bryce Lewis was. Like, I was just <laughs> everyone that's like king of the lifts right now on drugs. And then I started working with Mike and I was like, this guy's got some pretty good integrity, you know? Uh, it would be really like, when would he do them? He's got like, you know, he, he's got a lot to lose by getting caught. You know, if he, if he was on drugs, he's has a lot to lose. Like he's got a whole company's reputation to lose. He's got all of his lifters reputation to lose. Like it would be really weird. And so I, and the way he talks about drugs and the way he talks about lifting and like, it's, it's a different, I don't know. You can never really tell, but you can trust people. And I think that's what you're doing. It's like you trust people until proven otherwise. And it's not very healthy, especially because you're actively com competing against these guys. So I think you have to believe that you're capable of beating them. And and you can beat guys on drugs. That's the other thing. Just because you're on drugs doesn't mean you're going to respond well to them or that you're going to like be the best you know, lifter in the Federation. Oftentimes, 100%. it's people that aren't that good that take it and they just you know, they just don't really respond that well to it. Um, yeah, they, or like honestly, they, you know, um, I like, you know, so I changed gyms when I came back from, you know, the lockdowns and stuff. And I was training in a gym called Ultraflex. Um, mm -hmm. and I didn't know this for a while, but genuinely that the split of guys that are on steroids versus not on steroids, it's like a 60, 40 split of guys that are on gear. Like the actual number oh, of really? guys on gear is insane. Like, like mm -hmm. my friend was like, I met a guy that I was like really good mates with him or whatever. And he was like telling me like, you know, that guy's on gear, that guy's on gear. And I was like, even <laughs> yeah. that guy? I was like, I thought he was yeah. natural. He's so small. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. for bodybuilding. They all suck, but they're all, they're all on gear. <laughs> it's, it's literally just like, you know, like you're wasting yeah. your time and your money. What are you doing? You know, but you yeah. know, so it, it's, when you see people like that, they're on steroids and they, you wouldn't even, you, you wouldn't pick them out of a crowd and think they're on steroids at all, but you know, they are. So it's like, you know, obviously they think I'm on steroids. How could I not be on steroids? Given you're that bigger, I'm bigger and than, stronger than I'm all of them. Bigger than them. Yeah. I'm not training for bodybuilding. How, how could I not be? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Powerlifting yeah. is when small. <laughs> Power, <laughs> powerlifting is when really small. <laughs> the the fun thing I like to see is just seriously how big and like strong. I mean, how physically big and muscular powerlifters are. Because I think when when powerlifting like was hot, you know, in America, it was like a bunch of like old white guys that were like washed up from their shitty yeah. football high school career that were like all right how do we get how do we get strong let's use like triple ply equipment and then blast like all of the drugs love and it honestly then, <laughs> and game yeah, like, yeah let's be hugely yeah. fat as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then it's like raw 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 tested powerlifting becomes power uh popular and it brings in a lot more people because it's accessible it's you know attractive as well like it it tests your abilities as as you are and you get people from around the world that are are whether they're you know i mean i'm of the opinion at this point that of course your genetics are valuable you know in the sport now oh, i think i think that's what earlier I on get on to yeah 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 because like earlier on like when when raw lifting started like i could have competed at nationals you know like I mean, I, I'm weak as hell compared to the people I coach. Uh, like, I, I mean, I would be able to compete there right now with my current numbers. I need to add like 200 pounds to my total to compete at nationals right now. But um, my current le levels, you, you could you could compete with like a, th a few years of experience. And like you can now, but you better be responding like crazy to your training, you know, which which uh, I think I think is great. But it also kind of makes it seem like if you've always been an average athlete, you know, uh, powerlifting might still make you feel like an average, <laughs> an average yeah. athlete. You know what like, I mean? Ashton Ruska said it best, genuinely. Like, obviously, he's one of the most genetically gifted people that's in powerlifting right now because he's literally at the top. You know, he's like, he's like, I think he has like some of the highest uh, like IPF points or some of the highest, you know, in in in, in male powerlifting. Um, and even he said like, you know the the like how important genetics are like the massive span in genetic potential across all these different lifters like you know it, it is a the big it is the biggest factor and he was like we've not even seen the best guys yet like we've not even seen like pole thing is still too small 
Um, in the US, obviously, it's the it's it, you know the, the US has like the most like lifters I think in any federation. Um, it's the biggest over there, and as a result, obviously, the best guys are over there. So the amount of people that have said to me like in, in British powerlifting that have said to me like, oh well, those USA guys like they must all be on gear. Americans in particular, um, all of the sports that we have, you know, we're we are commodifying black athletes. You know, the the owners of all of the teams are primarily white, and one a socioeconomic way for people in general to get ahead is like if you go to the nba you can get out of your current t- scenario you know you can get out of your current t- situation and there's a huge amount of uh disparity in income like and income inequality between white and black people in america for example is very it's it's, it's high i don't know the, the specific numbers but there's a higher percentage of white people in a, a more well-off condition than uh than black people in america and so <clears throat> My understanding as part of this equation to like why we see this in high level sport, I don't know if it would be in powerlifting because I think powerlifting currently there's not really a socioeconomic advantage to to I participating well, in it. Like it doesn't work in powerlifting as well because powerlifting like has actually quite like a high barrier to entry when it comes to like you know actually you know if, if you want to powerlift you know you obviously you know you, you got to get all your equipment like you know you got to pay for a gym membership you got to pay for a, a decent level coach because you know you don't get that far without one of those which is you know mm-hmm. that all adds up and then you know on top of that you've also got you know your, 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 your payment for your federation you've got your payment for every competition that you enter like it adds up it's quite an expensive sport to just be able to do that so yeah 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 that's what what i mean like it's not only it's not only a big barrier but there's no like reward like there's no financial reward unless you're raw you know (laughs) usapl pro (laughs) pro uh whatever you get like five hundred dollars it's like cool thanks for the plane i mean and and i think that's difficult because you need i mean if you really want a sport to be making a lot of money you need stadiums full of people you need sponsorships from like every company on earth you know they like they're sponsored by like the uh, basketball is like sponsored by the airline industry um and so i i, I understand you know i, I don't want to make it seem like you're trying to say this i just one of these topics i had recently been discussing with with a friend of mine and you know he's like it's just not it's really because it's really it really is skewed by our perception of how we see athletic performance um and the rationale is 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 more of a cultural bias than it is like a truth it's just we happen to see a lot of like very powerful and strong black athletes and so we make the assumption like oh black people have better genetics but it's actually more so you know it's it's a lot more complicated than that and it's definitely not like if you take the best white athlete you know black athlete in any sport you're not going to see like oh this guy's got better genetic genetics you know what i mean um, it's really interesting. So I never, I never thought about that, but that does fully make sense. Um, it, and it's, it's interesting because, like, the thing is, you, you, like, you, you, we make these generalizations based on what we see. Um, but the mm-hmm. fact of the matter is, like, it's very hard to actually quantify someone's genetics and be like, I am more genetically gifted than you, or you're more genetically gifted yeah. than me. Like, for me, I, I take myself, and I don't think I'm that gifted as a lifter. I'm just incredibly persistent, and I refuse to give up. And that's yeah. the only reason yeah. I've clung on. Like, it's like every week as I've moved through, like, I was at 93, I moved to 105s, and then I look back at the 93s, I'm like, I'd never have been able to beat you guys. Like, and it's the same now. I'm a 120, yeah. I look back at the 105s, and I'm like, you guys virtually out total me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's the thing is, and I think Greg Knuckles has a has an article on Stronger by Science about like the it's like your genetics matter, but also like it's hard because if you're a lifter who if you're a person who's just going to be persistent at something and you have good genetics, then that's going to be the thing that you get good at. You know what I mean? Like if your genetics are predisposed to like strength sport. Uh, maybe you have a low, you know, low injury risk, your muscle tendons are just like insane and you can handle a lot of volume and like all the things that we see to be conducive to, to high level performance. Like if you happen to find that early on, then like good, <laughs> good job. Uh, and and all at the same time, like you do get stronger if you have any genetic uh you know disposition you're probably going to get stronger if you keep going on long enough and the thing and is so, as well the thing is as well like like how i've always like been told it and i what i also really agree with is kind of this mm-hmm. idea that you know you tend to do what you're good at 
So like, you know, if you're in powerlifting, the odds are you actually do have pretty good genetics compared to the average person. Like there's a reason yeah. you're stronger than most of the guys in the gym. And it isn't just because mm-hmm. you're training for powerlifting, you're training really smart and really specifically and you're taking that seriously. It is probably because you're naturally more predisposed towards powerlifting than those, than those other people in, the, in that gym, you know? So yeah. I, I, someone, you know, someone I probably did have good genetics, you know? But at the same time, good genetics versus great genetics and it's really hard to figure out to what extent you know and like yeah it's interesting and like taylor atwood for example this is the thing i always think about like i don't understand how the best lifters like five years ago are still some of the best lifters now you know with with the increase in the pool size he, he's an example of someone who has stood the test of time where like everyone else is getting like power creeped. Do you know what I mean? Like every, and like, you yeah. know, it's like, they, like, like the new guys are coming through the genetics pool is yeah. expanding and, you know, everyone's slowly getting phased out for the new guys. And it's happening in British politics mm-hmm. as well. It's happened, you know, the previous British champions now aren't anything. Do you know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah, Taylor they're, Atwood they're, somehow is still just number one. They're just, yeah. No, I'm just the best. Yeah, like all started, time number like, one. He started lifting in 20, like, I think he started competing in 2014. It's like, yeah, still here, yeah. mate. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. And like Johnny Candido, I mean, uh, I know he's not like the best in the world, but he's been able to consistently make progress too. Um, I, he's not, I don't think he's won nationals, but but he's been able to place and keep up, you know, like, because I remember when he totaled 1500 at 83 at Worlds in South Africa, I think. And it was like, holy shit, this guy is, you know, next level. And now like, 1500 you might not even compete at nationals at, at 83 mad, you know just the standard like it's how crazy fast increasing is absolutely wild yeah I, i've 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 struggled with that myself as like just a lifter who doesn't have like i don't i don't have international aspirations if i did i probably would have been more successful early earlier on but it, you know i do want to compete and i do want to get stronger and there's always this balance of like do you, do I work harder and maybe you know risk injury or do, how how long do I stay in this this training stress environment? You know what I mean? Like when is it time to do more? And will that more produce twenty kilos more, five kilos? You know, eighty. Like and then which which lift do we apply that extra focus and, and energy into? And that's what I was really curious about in terms of how you're training now, um, you know, compared to Euros, for example, you, you kind of mentioned that you came up with this kind of strategy with Eric, but are you shifting away? Are you shifting away from that like bottom up approach with with um, with Mark or are you guys still kind of using that? Um, so like basically we've kind of obviously i mean i think with eric i was doing some of the most work that i'd ever done like i was doing a lot of overall mm-hmm. volume and a lot of overall work and wasn't necessarily getting a whole lot more from that and i think that's just a, a kind of hurdle that you get to when you do get strong enough like there's a certain threshold i don't know where it is where it starts to be mm-hmm. like more, more just doesn't give you more i mean i think that's the case for a lot of people do you know what i mean that it's not even about strength it, that's that that is just how it is is you know it, it's about quality of work and it's about making what you're doing effective volume rather than just doing more volume you know like um but like like you know less is i think has always been more for most people um and mm-hmm. I, I really pushed towards that sort of like you know maximum like recoverable volume that everyone talks about um yeah genuinely just wasn't that great you know like there's an actual just gaining strength like you're doing so much work and your recovery is being pushed hard enough that it's like you know it doesn't you know you just don't have the energy to really be able to have your strength turn up session to session which means that you're just not getting as effective strength training in do you know what i mean like that's basically how that yeah. works so you know so you, no- um, you notice like a, a pretty high fatigue from that max yeah, effort yeah, or for maximum sure. volume for sure. and, and just you know uh, sessions being less consistent you know and, and, and that consistency is really surprisingly important as well for strength training I'm, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. not surprisingly it is important you know uh the the, the, the consistency in, in like performance like being able to consistently have good sessions session in session out for months on end uh, that's something that i've done for, for some of my clients it's like you know they, they they'll have been doing too much or pushing too hard and we pull back and they're like I always feel good now. I'm like, that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> like, like mm, if you're mm-hmm. having regular bad sessions, something's actually wrong there. You know, like you should have yeah. a really good quality. Yeah. And, 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 and that makes it really easy to like progress what you're doing. 
because you're consistently X strength. You know, there's no, there isn't that, you know, mad up and down, those mad swings. They're, they're much smaller. They're much more controllable. But yeah, to expand, I'm, I'm actually doing, I'm doing less work than I ever have before now. And I'm currently getting stronger uh -huh. off of doing that. I remember when I, like when I first, oh, really? 300, when I squatted, when I first squatted 300 kilos, I was doing like a top double. I was doing a five by five. On the other day I was doing like a five by six and on both sessions. I was doing split squats after that. And, like that was a lot of overall work for me um and and now i'm doing or i have been doing like in the past like a four by four and a four by six with nothing else and like that's been great for squat like it's felt fantastic it's, it's weird how that works but yeah sometimes less is more i've been i couldn't sleep last night because i've been thinking about this a lot like i don't know why but last night i was talking with one of the we hired a new coach for his out strength and well, we brought him on. You know, I don't really hire people. We just people want to work with us, so we say yes or no. Anyway, um, <laughs> he he's he's been challenging some of the like emerging strategies, you know, paradigms, and something that I notice. I don't know how if it's often, but like at some point, at some point, their their progress kind of just does this. You know, it just doesn't, it, the, the peaks don't necessarily get higher. They just kind of, they peak, they peak, they peak. And I think, you know, I think there's a time, a, a time which more volume is, is required um, or something. You know, it's hard for me to know if it's more volume, if it's more stress, if it's less stress. Uh, is it different exercises that we need to try? You know, do we need more variation from week to week? Like, it, 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 how and why can we push that peak pa past where it was before? And I think traditional, you know, strength training literature would indicate like more volume. That's what you got to do. Um, but then you know, I've worked with guys like you, and and typically it's like stronger guys where, and Corentin, for example, where we we had to pull things back pretty yeah, pretty good. Um. And then you get, you know, you get stronger and it's like, at some point, you know, it doesn't work anymore, but for, for a while it does. And I, I don't know how you notice it. I know you coach lifters too. Like, do you kind of run into that where, where you don't change enough things and, or like, there's not that like overall peaking growth. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'll talk about myself personally first. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm, I, I'm kind of proud of this. this is something I'm actually really proud of, um, which is that over the course of the 14 comps that I've done, my total has never gone down. It has exclusively gone up. Um, and on top mm -hmm. of that, along with that, obviously I've gained a lot of body weight, my IPF points or any formula that you want to use that they've always gone up as well. So I always strength to weight has always gone up. So I've never personally, I've never experienced that kind of peaking and just being at like the same kind of level. I've always mm -hmm. been able to make progress. And like, you know, that's always mm -hmm. obviously what you want to be shooting for. You always want to be taking steps forwards and, you know, have things steadily progressing. And, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to do to like put it together well enough in a comp to have that always happen. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like that's something that I've always been able to do. And I, as to how I've been able to do that, I'm not sure I have like a really clear answer. Like, it's just a willingness to like always push yourself, always, you know, be motivated. And I think that in itself, if you like, if you're the right kind of lifter, you'll find a way to succeed. And that's not nece mm -hmm. even necessarily like program, program related. A lot of it is the individual themselves. And, you know, um, I think the guys that I coach that, you know, have the least plateaus or the guys that, you know, are, 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 you know, that consistent with their, with their rate of progress and, you know, that, that have the best time of things with that are generally the guys that are the most motivated, the most committed and the most dedicated towards doing that similar to myself. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of it comes from the individual in that way. Um, I think when it comes to specifically programming, I think, um, when it comes to adding volume or, or, you know, adding overall work, adding overall stress, that's normally well, not overall stress, but when it comes to adding overall workload, I think that's normally the last thing that I would do. Um, just because I think that's like, okay, you know, we've, like, we, you know, we've done whatever else we can. Like at this point now we do just have to have to do more. Um, 
And I think that one of the earlier things that I would do is is obviously just to change your approach, just changing things up, like trying different things, like you know, different rep ranges, different R, like RPs and intensities, uh, different exercises. You know, try and uh, you know, you, you'll normally have a really good idea of what works. But there's, there's no harm in getting away from that and experimenting, especially when you have that time off to be able to do that um, and, 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 you know, try different things. Um, so I think that's a good way to go about things as well. Um, plateaus are hard, though. Like, especially, I think bench is the most common one to have a plateau on. Like, and it's it, they can be a hard one to break. Um, I think, I think this, you know, gaining body weight, it sounds bad, but like, if you want to get things moving again, especially with bench, it's normally the best way. Um, and, you know, these athletes that are having plateaus, a lot, a lot of times they're also their weight plateauing. You know, they're they're, they're not doing. They, they 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 may say they're doing everything that they can, but they're actually not doing everything that they can because they should be in a surplus year round. If you're not in a surplus year mm-hmm. round, you 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 are limiting yourself. That's just how that works. Yeah, yeah. I I just did a like a Myth Monday thing in the Discord community, and I was talking about how you know is it possible to do a body recomposition, uh, you know, as an advanced or like a trained lifter you know, reducing body weight and, and adding uh, strength or, or muscle. And I, I was d- digging into some of the literature and they say like, yeah, it's possible. It's probably more possible if you have like a pretty small, small surplus, I'm sorry, small deficit. So like a 200 calorie deficit versus like a 500 as you get kind of towards a 500 calorie deficit, uh, you're probably not going to gain muscle. You should be able to maintain strength if not gain, but, but muscle mass will likely reduce and eventually that'll likely lead to you know worse strength outcomes as well and like i find that to be an interesting it's almost like everyone wants to just hold on to their body weight for as long as they can and yeah you know adding adding mass to your body and and providing more more tissue to your body is probably going to lead to that that growth and (laughs) you know it seems like that's kind of happening with you it's happened with me. I mean, my deadlift isn't really improving. My squat and bench are though. And uh it's it's weird. And and then the other thing is like environment as well. Like how, what where are you training? Cuz like you mentioned it was really hard 100%. to to like get stronger while you're training at home. Yeah, I think um when it comes to environment, that's one of the biggest factors as well. Like um you know, it's one of the ones that no one talks about as well, but it is genuinely one of the biggest ones because who you surround yourself with is so key as well. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like a lot of plateaus I think happen because people like believe that something is challenging. They believe something is a heavy weight. It's a lot of it is mental. You know, you believe that that's something that you can't surpass or that's, you know, it's, it's a real challenge. And then you see mm-hmm. someone move that like it weighs nothing. And it's suddenly like, oh wow like what i thought was difficult like it's clear that you know there's a whole other level that i can i can reach and like for me that that definitely has happened when i used to train with like luke and 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 kieran and josh and like you know at the shed all the big boys and you know i i was first introduced to that and it was like wow there's like levels to this shit and i had to work harder because like there's these guys are outworking me and these guys are on the level that i want to reach and it was like that, you know, it just like, yeah, it just expands your mind. It makes you realize that, you know, I'm nothing right now uh, and, and I need to do better. Like I can do so much better because these guys have done it. These guys can do it. Why can't I do it? You know, it's that, and, it's that yeah, kind of mentality and they're, what you need. They're providing you with like a frame, you know, with like a framework too. Because like if they're, if they are, you're, you know training with you and, and they're working hard and then you're training and you're like i'm i'm good but then luke luke's out there just like grinding out set after set and he's getting stronger i feel like it gives you that confidence that it's okay to do more or whatever it's okay to focus hard it's okay to be in that environment um especially if you're a lifter listening and you find it difficult to like push yourself maybe it's just because you're not around people that are are doing that either Um, and, and maybe that means don't push yourself. Maybe it means for now, like just accept how you are and let the progress be slow or as fast as it needs to be. Cause I do find that when people start like changing who they are, like, all right, well now I'm going to just slap on the weights and just say, fuck it. I don't care about RPE. We're going to lift as much as as we can today. I mean, that doesn't seem to work out either. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) like, a terrible (laughs) approach. Never do that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do that because it's it's like you're ignoring things that are contributing to your bias. Like, the reason that you have a bias is because you've experienced stuff in your life that has had an impact on you. And I think 
as a coach, you know, you need to understand the lifter's bias because that is their trained experiences, you know, their experiences in training that have happened to them that mean something to them that likely matter in terms of what you want to do to, to move to the next level. And, you know, I'm sure you've noticed this and you're a prime example, like as a self, you know, you kind of, you're aware of your training. You're not just like, okay, I'm putting in the work, whatever you're, you're thinking about your training and how it's responding. And I think some coaches are intimidated by that because like you might work with someone. I think, I think good coaches now, like they get it, but I think early on it's like, well, I have my system, so just do what I say. But I think now people are realizing, like, hey, that's not really how you coach anymore. Like, you yeah, can't, that, like, 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 and that, you know, obviously work. you're paying you're paying X amount, right? And you're paying for, yeah. like that, for that coach to coach the individual. If you're saying this right. is how 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 I do things, this is how we're gonna do it. Like, you're not coaching yeah. an individual at all. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, for me, yeah. one of the most valuable pieces of feedback is from the individual is either this felt productive or it didn't feel productive you you know mm -hmm. like if you do something you know if it felt like it was doing good it's it's shocking how simple that question is but how effective that is that that's when it comes to accessory work when it comes to you know level of intensity and top sets when it comes to volume work whatever like if you know the question of did it feel like it was effective is surprisingly a good question to ask and that's something that a coach should really take on board it's straightforward but it makes a difference it really makes a difference yeah yeah um so what is coming up with your in your training right now what's what's on the horizon you just won a british championship yeah, um, do you want to talk <laughs> do you want to talk about the british championships was that was that how did you feel going into that meet like what was that like for you so um but it was kind of weird because obviously um, I came third six months ago at the last British Championships um, and I was expected to come third again. That was kind of like, if I'm lucky, like I should be able to hold that position and do that again um, because the top two guys, Kieran and Tony, are just on another level, honestly. It's a level that I'm eventually trying to get to, but they're just absolutely killing it. Um and, and you know Tony has obviously been at the top of the game for like a really long time. Like he is a previous IPF World Champion. Tony Cliff. Yeah, a previous IPF world champion, and he came second like this last year. So like you know, he's sort of goals, isn't he? Really, do you know? What I mean? um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, like you know, those two guys are you know, it's going to take me a long time to catch up to those or be on that kind of level. Um, so I was like, you know, I'll come third, and then Tony basically is doing a quick this year. Um, he's got world the world games he's focusing on, so that's that's what where all of his time and energy is, is going into. So he he's not doing raw. So he was like, cool, I'm not doing that. So it just left me and Kieran. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, hopefully I can come second. That's an improvement on my like, my previous placing. I'm really happy with that. That's the goal. Um, and then uh, a few weeks out, Kieran messaged me and told me that like, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing it. I've I've, I've, I've tweaked my pack. And it was like, okay, uh, I guess I'm going to win then. <laughs> and yeah. like, you know, obviously there's a couple of other strong guys that could challenge me. Like, I, you know, Indiraj being definitely one of them. Um, Bo being, uh, Bo Powerfting being another guy that was, he's totaled 885 in the past. So he's right there. But he's had a bunch of injuries, and he ended up being injured as well, so didn't even didn't even go. So he wasn't there. So it was literally I got there in the day and realized it was just me and Indiraj, and it was just a one v one. And I've done mm -hmm. I've that, that's like my I've, I've worked it out. It's like my seventh one v one in terms of like I've had you know often you go to a powerful comp and you compete and you you know you do your thing and you lift X Y and Z and that's that's the day. That was me at the last British where it didn't really matter what I totaled. I could total anywhere, anywhere from like 800 all the way to like 870 and I'd still have come third. So there's a massive range there. So I absolutely fully maxed out every kilo. I hit perfect thirds and squeezed everything I could because it didn't matter. Um, you know, do, doing that in a comp is very different and just focusing on the numbers and focusing on what you can lift is very different to when it's an actual competition. And it's like me and this guy yeah. are really similar strength. And, you know, what he does affects what I'm going to have to do. And, like, I need to gauge myself off of what he's doing. And I need to compete directly against this guy to hopefully try and win at the end of this. And I, this, yeah. that was my seventh one. So I came into that like, cool, it's a 1v1. We've been here before. We've done this before. We know what we've got to do. Um, and I played the game perfectly. So in the end, um, I totaled 865. I was looking to do total more. But at the end of the day, you do what you need to do. Um, he missed his squat opener and like literally as soon as he missed that, I looked at my handler and I was like, cool. He's just blinked, you know? We just go conservative and, now and we should be able to wrap this up pretty easy. 
Andy, Andy missed a squad opener? Yeah, he missed a squad opener. Um, so at that point, I took a more considerate second attempt and a more considerate third attempt. And they, I, I had kills on every on every lift. I could have done more on every lift, but at that point, it wasn't really needed. Um, and it all just, it all played out exactly kind of how I was hoping it would. Um, and you know, in the end, obviously, I had a lot, a lot more in my deadlift, but very little more in terms of like my grip. Um, mm -hmm. We chose that attempt because um, we were fairly confident that he would drop his third, just based on. Like my handler had apparently seen him walk off looking at his hand and saying to his coach that he felt like his grip was slipping. So it was like, okay, if mm. your grip's slipping on 360, if we push you another 18 and a half kilo, uh, 18 kilos, like you're probably not going to hold on to that. Like we probably, we could probably yeah. do that. So that, that was the, that was the plan. And, you know, I, like I would have loved to have lifted more, but at the same time, it was all about getting the win because genuinely like, Obviously, I've just won the British. I, I don't think I've ever have won it after this comp. I was so nervous knowing it was 1v1 and knowing how capable I was of winning it based on who, who was there. I was so nervous because like, this is like my one chance to do this. Like, I might never get to do this again. And like, does that devalue it a little bit knowing that I only won because these top two guys weren't there? Like, yeah, sure. Like, it definitely does. Like, it definitely, you know, at the end of the day, though, like you can only beat you can only beat the guys you're against, um, and yeah, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. Like you can only beat who turns up, and like to, to an extent, I'd also say like you know, being able to stay injury free year round, which I have touch wood. Like I'm several years in of, 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 of several years since my last injury. Like that sometimes makes a difference, and you know, apparently sometimes it also wins you a comp because like you know a big <laughs> comp as well. Because yeah. like I I won because I didn't get injured. That's the only reason I won. And, you know, because because Kieran won. And there. it's like it's. It's different than like a, a, a football or basketball where like you get injured by other people because you get in a hit or collision or something. Yeah. Like your injury risk is almost always related to your, your training conditions. And so yeah. you and the, have the, the control The truth of the matter those. is, I think if you get injured as well, it's probably something within your control that's meant that you've gotten injured. Like I'm not throwing shade yeah. at anyone that's ever got an injury because obviously it just happens sometimes. But at the same time, yeah. normally if it happens, I've had enough injuries in my time. If it happens, you can find something. There's normally something that's like, this is the contributing factor to that. Even yeah. if it's like, okay, clearly I was doing too much overall work. It was some error with the programming or or whatever. Like there's normally some indicator that there's an in the injury like looming, you know, like normally it's, yeah. uh, in my opinion, it's very fatigue based as well. Like when you're in that extreme, like overreaching kind of period and you know, you're, you're quite beat up quite regularly, like that leads to injury. You have to be really careful to manage that. You know, that's a skill in mm -hmm. itself. That, so. and that's i think that's the main point it's like it's part of the game like if you get injured and that's not why you're and that's why you're not at the competition i mean you lost before you got there it's not like hey i couldn't go because my you know i had to go to a, a funeral or something it's like you your, your game plan as part of the competition it didn't work and so yeah. it, it's kind of like it's kind of like the you know march madness or whatever you, you're like you, you do your earlier earlier easier competitions and then you get to the big one and, and if you don't make it because you you got hurt along the way i mean it's fair game it's not to put blame on that person either obviously it's just like that is what you're doing all day every day you're you're trying to manage your training variables so that you can have a good outcome at a competition and unfortunately if those variables aren't managed well enough the injury happens and you don't even get to be there and uh yeah, I mean that's part of the game. Not to make it like it's it's not your fault. It's just that it's not. Uh, I don't think it devalues it. You know, I don't think it devalues you going and showing up and doing what you had to do to put yourself in the best position to perform for you. And that ended up being the best the best total. Like I think that. Yeah, obviously Tony Cliff being there would be a different story, but you know, he, he wasn't, wasn't there either. That's all that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, that's awesome. I want to move on to some questions, so this doesn't oh, turn quickly, into our quickly. podcast. Yeah, so you asked you ask okay. what's next. Um, yeah, 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 what's next? Unofficially, Worlds. That's what's next. Okay. <laughs> so I'm Where is that, that supposed and, uh, South Where Africa. is that supposed to be? So, it's South, Africa. South Africa and right. Sun City. But yeah, um, obviously for me, there's a lot of uh, focus going towards that now, especially given the last time I was at Worlds, obviously the worst comp that I've ever had in 14 comps, you know, in terms of like my mindset, like during the comp and after it, how I felt about that performance. So, you know, obviously for me, um, I, I'm very like motivated to make this the best comp I've ever had and to really, yeah, yeah, 100%.
That'd be so cool. And you know, so you've learned so much about yourself as a lifter too yeah, since man. then. Like it's a whole different was, ball game. I'm so ready. <laughs> you're, yeah. It's so it's so cool to see because yeah, like I, we said in the beginning of the episode, like that was the worst comp you had. I was coaching you. I felt bad, <laughs> you know. But but like you said, all on the contrary, like let's imagine a different scenario. Let's let's imagine a scenario where we didn't like have the worst performance ever, but like you did all right. You know, like we didn't totally like, let's say we just hovered around like the same strength that we were at. And we just, we just like, you would have, you would have performed well, but we wouldn't have learned that what we tried, like definitely doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and like, like I, I don't think I'd be as strong as I am today if I had just done okay. Like sometimes the yeah. bad performances are the most productive in terms of changing your approach and changing how you go about things for sure. Yeah. Yeah that's that's the that's the silver silver lining and uh, uh, as an athlete but as a coach you just like it's an ego slap in the fucking face you know like you don't you you need to be on it the whole time you can't assume anything you can't be you can't be in this position where you think you know the the outcome like there's errors and predictions and uh if you're too confident in your predictive capabilities and you're wrong. It's like, well, now what are you relying on? Your next prediction? Uh, like, you know, use the the data that you have to help you as much as you can. And, uh, you know, likely that'll that'll help if you have good resources. Um, to wrap up, we have six questions. One oh, is from K, K18DSR. K18DSR. Oh, Do you know who that is? Yeah, I know who that is. <laughs> David uh, said, yeah, yeah, go he, on. He said, will you ever do a competition without sandbagging your body weight or your lifts? Um, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll eventually get yeah. to be a full 120 <laughs> and we'll fully max out. Yeah, yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, 100%. Just to make it less like attacking on your end. Like, I don't think there's a value in like jumping to 120 immediately. Oh, oh no, he's you know? definitely attacking me. That's definitely the goal. I, yeah, yeah, 100%. No, I'll I know try. he is. I'm just I'll saying. Do I'm do just better, Dave. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh ted Bell said what's your favorite oral steroid oh um i don't have any mate sorry <laughs> wait do you know a guy named ted Bowles? yes is he i do your friend <laughs> oh okay sorry okay. these questions just seriously okay. being roasted yeah, yeah continue yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait no the next question is the next question is from a guy named george and he says is ted Bowles your weakest client <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he's not. He's not. He's not. I do coach him. He's not. Him. <laughs> Only one guy, though. That's fun. Right. Okay. It might be one of the th the three remaining. Okay. Uh, Ab Abdul Ab Abdul um, Mojid um, yeah, says, yeah, yeah, "Will you?" He said, "Will you ever be returning to the 105s?" No. No, I won't. No. I don't want to get to no way, for life. No, sorry. I, 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 yeah. I can't. I can't. You are, you already have running, me at the British camps. <laughs> like it's rough enough running, in the British. And yeah. Look at the 105s. And Sam Watson with yeah. 887. And Mo, oh the guy that I beat God. in my last, you know, last Nationals win, told 876. And I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> talk about talk about longevity, man. Sam Watts like jumps into powerlifting oh. like randomly at like 40. <laughs> and he's just like getting stronger each year, too. Like, that's nuts. I can't believe the um, that. It's insane. Yeah. He 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 would he would be he would be doing well in the masters at at in in you know in the US. Um, I mean, mate, sure. not even in the US. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's the previous ma Masters World Champion, and I'm pretty sure he, he would. Oh, is he? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he holds the world record, and I'm pretty sure, yeah, he's just the best. Like, you know, it's not even Damn. Masters. Like in the Opens, if you, if he did the Opens at, at Worlds, I'm pretty sure he places pretty well. It's crazy. Is he 83? No, he's 105. He's 105, he's, and he's like he's 102, I think he's 52 years old. Like he's literally, That's he's literally like the nuts. the goals of everybody. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like one day we'd all yeah. like to be that old, and that's not that old, but we'd all like to be, you know, yeah. in the sport for that long and still be as good as he is, you know. And like getting stronger too. That's the coolest thing. Like it actively improving. It doesn't even make no, sense. No, I know. <laughs> I very much would like to see his training approach. Um. Okay, the next one is from, from a guy ben named Pape. Philip, and he asks, "Oh, go on. Yeah. What, what's that?" Oh uh, no, it doesn't matter. I know, the, just I know asked, there's one from Pape as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, 
<laughs> this one's from Philip. It says, how, how, how do you get stronger? How do you get started in powerlifting? Like, what would you recommend for someone to get started? How would someone get started? Um, honestly, I would jump into a competition fairly early on. A lot of, a lot of, especially men tend to wait because they don't feel they're strong enough. And I feel like competing in itself is a real skill. I mean, I've done 14 comps, like I say, and I feel like I'm still mastering how I'm pe- how to peak. I'm still mastering what works for me in terms of that. I'm still getting better in my approach every comp to how I go about their act of competing. It's a real skill. So the sooner you can get experience in that and learn what powerful is all about, the, the, the better off you'll be. Um, and I think it's a really good way of deciding if it's something that you actually enjoy and want to properly pursue. Um, and if not, that's fine. Like if you just want to train in powerful, that's also completely fine. Um, and if that's the case, I think that the, the, the best thing I could advise is, um, you know, if you're really new, honestly, just hop on a free program and just have fun with that and stick to a program. Don't deviate. You know, obviously people hop from program to program. It's, it's not the best. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, once if you're at an intermediate level of, of lifting, you've been doing it for a little while, I would recommend getting a coach. Like get someone who has a lot more experience than you, who knows a lot more than you um, and get them to guide you. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, powerlifting is no different to any other sort of like high level sport where all of the you know top guys, they all they all have coaches. So why would you do differently in, in lifting? It's, it's literally no different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love that. I wouldn't add anything. Wouldn't add anything. And then Ben Pape says, who's yes. the strongest Ben in the British powerlifting? Me, motherfucker. Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know why? Because you told 860 and I told 865. <laughs> Let's not talk about it. All that matters is the numbers that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Overall strength. That's why we that's are we bulking. Let's not talk <laughs> yeah. about the strength to weight ratio. Let's not talk about the IPF points. They don't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. There's no, yeah, no weight classes in the (laughs) wild. (laughs) Um, All right, Ben. Well, hey, thank you for being on, man. It's been pretty cool to catch up. Um, I'm pretty, I'm really happy to see how you've been approaching lifting and like obviously your successes because uh, it's not often that you can get someone that's as dedicated as you are who can stick with it as long, push through it during like the hard times, you know. And and learn like you're always learning something. It's obvious, and you obviously apply that for yourself as a lifter, but also a coach. So, yeah, man. Um, guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Dell Strength and share this episode with your friends. We'll talk to you next time.